Custer Peak Road. We're heading up to the Custer Peak uh, Fire Tower, um, which is uh, just south of Brownsville. We're driving through actually a stand now that has been completely killed by, by the mountain pine beetle. And when we get up on top of the fire tower here, you'll be able to get a good panoramic view of, of the hills here. And, Um, that hillside you're pointing to there is the same hillside that as we drove in, I was telling you, uh, the, the back side of it, they, they wouldn't let us in any of this stuff up in here. Actually this, this side too, because they were protecting goshawk nesting habitat and they left the stands dense and, and didn't allow thinning in there to protect goshawk nesting habitat. And then in the end, the mountain pine beetle has, has killed almost all the the live trees in there. So they live right under the bark. They, they bore in through the bark there. And the adults, when they get in, they get in this layer called the cambium, which is where all the sugars flow up and down the tree. And the adults make this vertical gallery. And then all these little squiggly lines on the offshoot are where they lay their eggs and then the babies start eating in there. Yep, and then they'll change from that into something that actually looks more like a beetle, and they'll be kind of white and, that's and one tannish. That's there. He's not old enough to fly, and when another couple of weeks, that one will probably be be fully developed. Okay. Yeah. There they go. Yeah, you can see them good there. And your finger's good for a size reference. folks that are um, special interest groups, let's just categorize them, they have a different agenda. By the, by the, the uh, agreement that the industry made, with, or the public made with the Forest Service, there are certain things we just can't do. You know, we have snails, we have birds, we have rocks, we have a, a, a multitude of things that handcuff you. So if you're going to save a forest, we need to sweep all that under the carpet, save the forest, and start over. Right. You know, I mean, we have to we have to get an agenda that is. It isn't industry out here just saying we want to murder and rape the forest. That isn't the case. We, that is, we want it to have some longevity. We want it to continue. But if you're going to save the forest, we have to attack the trees, not just the ones that are merchantable for the for the sawmill to make a living at it, and myself. We need to address every tree as the best as we When you have a tool this close from me to you, and because of a magical line that is on the ground by somebody's uh, video or... Uh, yeah, some, someone that hasn't even been on the ground. Because of that line, I can't cross that line, but just across it is totally... I mean, yeah, just hit by bugs. There's just no way you can just stop at lines. I think Paul's right. You have to address the whole, the forest as a whole, not just by these lines that are put on the ground. So this machine is called a feller buncher. Uh, it's got that red head on it that can it'll grab a hold of the tree. He pushes a button and a chainsaw comes out at the base, cuts the tree off with stump. He has complete control of it. He backs up and he lays it in a in a pile, we call it a bundle. And as he drops that tree down, he can miss all the little trees that we want to save. 
It gives him complete control of where the tree is going to go while protecting the residual stand and it's safe because he's in a cab that if something does go wrong, it'll protect him from a tree. If it does land on him, nobody will be hurt. He can do, depending on the, the density of the timber, about 500 trees a day with that machine. And so you can kind of notice uh, in here that all the trees have blue paint on it. That was, the blue paint was put on them to let us know which trees have mountain pine beetle in them and then we're allowed to cut them. Um, and once they're, once they're bundled like this, a skitter will come, grab a hold of the whole bundle and drag it out to the side of the road where the boom delimiter will, will then take the limbs off it. But he can squeak that tree right through there without damaging the other trees. And plop her down. But hey, it's our national forest. It's not a wilderness area. We need to be managing it for multiple uses, including timber production and recreation and wildlife. If you're gonna wanna hunt in these areas, no boy, when all this stuff hits the ground, you won't be able to get through it. Let me tell you what they're doing in Wyoming right now. I don't know what publication it was. It's Wyoming Wildlife, what month, I can't tell you. And what they're doing down there, the game and fish, is giving, they're, they're, they're tagging a certain amount of elk, and then they have hunters that have volunteered their time, and they're putting GPSs on their hunters. It's in the Wyoming Wildlife, it's an article in there. They are so concerned about the elk harvest and where the hunters are gonna be able to go to get to where they, you would normally hunt because the bugs have closed all the roads. There's no funding to go clean those roads up so they can get into where they need to elk hunt. The forest has totally shut down in certain places where they are not able to do their, their elk harvest like they're envisioning it to happen. It was a very interesting article that that that's just the, the wildlife phase of it, just just the elk hunting. Sure, other things will do well. You know, if, if you're into uh, um, bull thistle and, and uh, green Most gentian and- Mice and, habitat. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, they, t they talk about uh, corridors for pine martens. Okay, you can't, you, you gotta leave that overstory in there for the pine martin. Okay, and all of the trees, in one instance where I was, the, the pine corridor was left in place because they were, protecting. they were protecting it, I guess, all right? But all the trees were bug hit. So I went back there, and it's been two years, and I went back there. Every one of those trees is dead, broke off, laying on the ground. The pine martin has moved on. But, we could, but at that point where the pine martin was, that corridor that, that they deemed that we needed to protect at that time, on the other side of that was plum green trees. If I would have cut that corridor out, I could have saved, saved the forest that was on the other side of it because it was a corridor marked on a map by somebody in the wildlife department. We left those trees. So therefore, the bugs that were in those flew, killed the ones on the other side of it. So eventually, those, that poor old pine martin, before long, he's going to beetle Reynolds Prairie and, and he's going to go, oh, wait a minute. You know, that's where we could have done some good. We could have, if we could work with those people on the ground while it's happening, but I just don't, I don't think they get it. I, I honestly don't think they get it. It's frustrating. I guess the biggest term is it's frustrating when you know what needs to be done and you can't do it. So how do you get other people involved in it that can help you make a difference? How do you do that? How do you get somebody that can come in and say, look, you know, I'm gonna study this I'm going to figure out how and what we can do with this bug. It's going to take forever, and by, and by the time that happens, it's going to be too late. It is staying going to happen. This but, but what we know works doesn't have to be studied anymore. I mean, what works is having a healthy forest, removing the trees that are infested when you find them, and thinning out the areas that need thinning. 